So uh, I've drawn the short straw and I'm leading off. And um, I think probably as far as the topic of this conference goes, my paper is going to be an outlier because it doesn't have much to do with meaning. In fact, it doesn't have anything to do with meaning. Um, actually, that's not quite true. There are some connections, and I might talk about those at the end if there's time. But most of this talk is a technical talk, and it's on um, the models um, side of the business. So what I want to do is talk about models of power consistent set theory. Um, there's an awful lot we don't know about these yet, and I don't have any definitive answers, but uh, I want to sort of share some model constructions with you to give you a flavour for the sort of thing that's going on at the moment. So that's uh, the most important thing I want to do, but let me explain you know, how we got to where we are at the moment. So um, you should have a handout in front of you, and... I'm going to be referring to that a lot, so you'll want to sit. Anyone not got a handout? All right. And I've made the handout because it's sort of one of those talks where it's quite useful to have the technical details in front of you, so you can refer back to them. So this is about set theory. And um, naive set theory uh, is axiomatized as in section one. So there are three axiom schemas. So the first is comprehension. Uh, every condition defines a set. Uh, and the usual const constraint is that the, the, the Y not occur in A. In fact, I mean, you can actually dispense with that constraint. It doesn't actually affect much. Uh, uh, it doesn't sort of threaten triviality where there was no triviality before. But at least for the purpose of today, I'm going to assume that the Y is not free in A. The second. Uh, Axiom is extensionality, and then you can have choice if you want. Again, it won't play much role today. Are we, are, are, are we taking questions? So are we playing by RK rules? Uh, Ulla said RK light. Hmm? Clarification question. Clarification question. Oh dear. Thank you. Yep. X not free. Okay, good. Um, yep. It doesn't matter. It'll, it'll play no role in today. Um, so, uh, I mean, one thing about uh, allowing X to be free in A uh, is that you can actually prove choice. Um, that's an old result of Richard Routley. Uh, it was polished by Zach Weber. Um, of course, there are other ways of getting choice. You can use Hilbert's epsilon operator, or you can just um, take it neat, as it were. Uh, but, but for today's purposes, nothing is going to depend on that. Okay, and uh, those axioms represent something like naive set theory, that is, our untutored beliefs about sets uh, and naive beliefs, um, naive in the, the old French sense of natural. Um, but of course, they're inconsistent. And the way that historically things went when this was discovered was uh, to retain the underlying logic of something like classical logic, but to weaken the comprehension principle. Uh, but now that power consistent logic has been invented and can't be uninvented, there is another option on the table, which is to retain the set theoretic principles and just weaken the logic in such a way that uh, you might get inconsistency but you don't get triviality. So, as usual, the function of a power consistent logic is to kind of uh, uh, turn the contradictions into singularities, which don't spread methodized to the rest of the set theoretic body. Um, and that's the investigation of power consistent set theory. Now, uh, that's the easy part. Uh, the set theoretic principles. What's not so easy is the underlying logic. Uh, clearly one wants to be able to do justice to the richness of set theory. Um, and what underlying logic you use is not at all obvious. Now, uh, one possibility is to take the underlying logic to be the most basic, the simplest, power-consistent logic, LP, 
and many of you will know what that is, but if you don't, I will tell you in a minute. Um, and in that case, the conditional and the biconditional in these axioms are the conditional and biconditional of LP, and that does, these do not detach. You can't use uh, sort of modus ponens for the material conditional. This is not valid in LP. So that doesn't recommend itself if you're trying to prove things, obviously. Um, so that's one strategy, and it really doesn't look very promising. Another strategy is to take the uh, underlying logic to be some kind of relevant logic which does have a detachable conditional. Uh, in that case, the conditional and biconditional are those of some relevant logic. Now, again, that's not straightforward just because um, you have to have a relatively weak relevant logic because if you have principles like contraction, you get Carrier's paradox. Now, many of you will know what Carrier's paradox is. I'm not going to talk about it now. Um, if you don't know, it doesn't matter. Just take my word for it that you need a relatively weak relevant logic to do this. And the problem is that once you get to a, relevant, uh, a relatively weak relevant logic, it's actually very hard to reconstruct the proofs of classical set theory. Because um, these seem to depend on principles of conditionality, which you just do not have in these weak relevant logics. Yeah? When you say very hard, do you mean dual hard approval or not approval? Uh, okay, let me answer that question. Um, so w when the bunch of us in Australia were first thinking about this stuff in the 70s, um, we, we, we knew that suitably formulated the theory was non-trivial. That's an old result of Ross Brady. But that actually doesn't tell you much. We were interested in what you can prove. And many of us tried to reconstruct the classical proofs and failed. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of good people like John Slaney, Bob Meyer, Chris Mortensen, Ross Brady, and myself, um, and the, the results just wouldn't go through. So we, we gave up. Um, now, about 10 years ago, Zach Weber, uh, an American student, came to work with me in Melbourne. And he wanted to work on the enclosure schema. Again, if you don't know what that is, it doesn't matter. And he wanted to talk about free will and determinism and stuff like that. I said, yeah, fine, go for it. So he'd been in Melbourne for about four or five months. And he came to me and he said, well, you know, I've got interest in proving results in naive set theory using irrelevant logic. And I said, you don't want to do that. This is, you know, you, this is impossible. Give up. And he said, no. So I thought, oh, well, try, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm glad he ignored my advice because um, he actually went ahead and uh, he succeeded where the rest of us had failed 30 years before, 20 years before. Stuart was an examiner of the thesis. Um, and what was novel about Zach's approach was that he didn't actually make the old proofs work. He had to find totally new proofs, all right? And the proof techniques he used were contentious, but they're kind of interesting in their own right. So um, what Zach actually did was to prove all the standard results of set theory, well, at least all the results of cardinal or, 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 and ordinal arithmetic in this weak relevant logic. Um, so he had a lot of success. Uh, uh, so that's more or less where the situation stands at the moment. So what, what that shows is that you can... Uh, you can recapture most of, you know, uh, Cantorian set theory. But of course, set theory has gone a long way beyond that nowadays. And uh, one wants to know, well, oh, yeah, what about the rest of the things we do with set theory? And crucially, you know, what about model theory? Because, you know, set theory is the vehicle of model theory. So how much model theory can you actually do? And the jury on that is still out. Uh, again, it looks as though they're going to be the same sorts of problems. I think Zach is working on this now. Uh, <coughs> from my own view, I, I'm not terribly optimistic, but you know, I was wrong before, so maybe I'll be wrong again. OK, so that's the sort of second approach to use a relevant logic. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Because there is a third approach, um, which is the one I'm going to talk about. And that is to go back and uh, use the basic paraconsistent logic LP uh, so that the conditional and biconditional are those of LP but you know, it's, it's 
you're not going to do this thing, I think, proof theoretically. You have to do it some other way. And the strategy is model theoretic. So, um, any, axiomatic, any axiomatic theory has many models, of course. Some of them are clearly pathological, some are not. Just think about non standard models for arithmetic. Um, and uh, naive set theory, thus formulated, uh, has many, many models as well. Some of them are clearly pathological. For example, there's a one element model, obviously pathological, and then there's a lot of obviously non pathological models. Well, there are a lot of models which one might hope are not pathological. Um, and the aim is to you know, figure out which one or one of these gives us the best understanding of the universe of sets. Now, of course, to do that, one's got to have some understanding of what the structure of the totality of models is like. And we do not yet have that. Yeah? What's the, uh, so now that we're doing model theory, we have to ask about the meta theory. What's that? Um, OK, it's going to be ZF. Because what I'm going to tell you is there a way that you can accommodate ZF in this naive set theory. You'll see how when we get there. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, you can, all the, okay, all the results I want to talk about, you can think of them as being done in ZF. But you'll also see how um, one can appropriate this in a certain way para consistently. Um, okay. So, um, what we're trying to do at the moment is to get an understanding of the, the possible models of paraconsistent set theory. Um, and then we'd be in a position to say, well, you know, this one, or maybe these ones, look like good candidates for the universe of sets, um, and the others are just sort of byproducts in a sense. And uh, what, we will, what we can see is that there are, um, there are models of paraconsistent set theory which are also models of ZF. I don't just mean models of the axioms, I mean models of all the theorems of ZF. Okay, we'll see that today. Um, and if that's the case, then I was, as I was saying to Stuart, um, you can think of your model theory as being done in ZF and just appropriate the results. If you think that your universe or universe of sets are of this kind, namely universes which validate both naive set theory and ZF. Okay, so um, that, that's where we're going. And I want to show you to, well, I want to show you one principle of model construction, which constructs uh, some interesting models. Um, I, uh, I don't pretend that these are anything more than tools for constructing some interesting models. Uh, I think we've still got the hard work to do of, you know, charting in some sense the structure of the totality of models uh, so that we can make an informed choice. But this is at least a small step in that direction. Okay, so... Um, let me spell out the uh, logic LP for those of you that don't know it. And many of you will, of course. So this is in section two. So there's uh, a language, which is a standard first order language. Um, I'll assume there are no function symbols just to keep life simple, but we have identity. So the material conditional and biconditional are defined in the usual way. And a bit of notation that's less familiar is this a shriek. And that's just a and not a. It's just a useful bit of notation. An interpretation, which is this factor M, uh, has the usual components. It has a domain of quantification, big D, which is not empty. And then a denotation function, delta. So for every constant C, uh, the denotation of C is a member of the domain. And um, for every n place predicate, uh, it has to have two components, uh, an extension and an anti-extension. Because in classical logic, you only need to specify the extension because the complement is the anti-extension. Whereas once truth and falsity fall apart, as they do in LP or K3 or anything like that, you have to have a separate specification of each. So. Um, the denotation of any n place predicate is uh, a pair x, y, where the union of those two things is the set of all interpoles of the domain. And a bit of notation, I'm going to write x and y 
in terms of delta plus and delta minus as the handout shows. And the, de the, the extension of the identity predicate is always what you'd expect it to be. Uh, and that's sufficient to give you the standard principles of identity like substitutivity and so on. So that's an interpretation. Um, truth and falsity conditions. Um, you now have to give truth and falsity conditions separately because truth and falsity have come apart. So um, how, do you, how do you read this turnstile? False, but that's not great in this context. Okay. Makes. Um, makes. So this with a plus is makes true. This with a minus is makes false. All right. So uh, an atomic sentence is made true or made false just if the um, appropriate interval of the denotations of the constants involved is a member of the, either the extension or the anti-extension of the predicate. Uh, a negation is made true if it's uh, what it's uh, the, the negated thing is made false duly. Uh, conjunctions are true if both conjuncts are true. False if one or other conjunct is false, and so on. Um, just have a look at the um, particular quantifier. Uh, I'm making the assumption that every object in the domain of the model has a name, and you, it's just easier that way. You don't have to talk about satisfaction. So I'm assuming that the language is augmented by a constant, k little d, for every d in the domain. So the, I'll, go, I'll call that the language of the interpretation. Um, so um, there is an x such that a is made true, just if for some d in the domain, what you get uh, when you substitute the constant denoting d for the free variable x in a is also made true. And uh, uh, there is an x such that a is made false just if for every d in the domain, when you substitute the name of d for x, the result is made false. So, of course, these are exactly the classical conditions, but in the classical case, half of them are redundant. All right, so um, final definition of validity. Uh, a formula, uh, an interpretation is a model of a formula if it's made true, uh, in the interpretation. It, an interpretation is a model of a set of formulas if it's a model of every formula, and an inference is valid if every interpretation which makes the premises true makes the conclusion true. So, all this is very familiar. Okay. Now, the material by conditional is going to play an important role in what follows. So let's just run through some of its properties to make sure that, I mean, you know what doesn't happen, it doesn't detach, but mostly it behaves as you expect it to behave. So section three tells you some properties of um, the material by conditional. The first uh, three tell you that a material by conditional is true if and only if uh, its two flanks are either both true or both false. And the next three tell you that the material by conditional is false if and only if one flank is true and the other flank is false. All very familiar stuff. Um, the next three tell you about, uh, tell you that the material by condition is reflexive, symmetric, it ain't transitive, okay? It ain't transitive for exactly the same reason that detachment fails. Um, and, uh, if A if and only if B, B if and only if C, you can't infer A if and only if C, but you can infer A if and only if C or B shriek. And then uh, the last two maybe look the most puzzling. If A shriek, then A if and only if B. Now, why on earth is that true? Well, in this logic, you've got excluded in middle, right? So B is either true or false. Now, if A shriek, then A is true. So if A is true and B is true, well, then the material by condition is true. And if B is false, well, A is false too, so the material by condition is true. So in either case, okay, you've got the material by conditional. But of course, um, uh, if A shriek, then whatever B is, 
Okay, I suppose B is true. Well then, uh, because A shriek is true, A is also false. So you've got the negation of the material biconditional as well, and that's what this, this last thing tells you. So those last two things look slightly odd, but once you see why they work, then uh, it's, it, it's fairly natural. All right. So that's uh, the properties of the material biconditional. Now we're going to do some model construction, and for that we need some simple techniques of model theory. So the next two sections are, are some model theory. Okay, so uh, section four is about monotonicity. So uh, the definition of less than or equal to for models or interpretations is that M1 is less than or equal to M2 just if they have the same domain and uh, the extension of M2 is at least as great as the extension of M1 and same for anti-extension. So you kind of, you're, uh, you, you're allowed to sort of make the anti-extension, the extension bigger, okay. Uh, and the monotonicity lemma says that if M1 is less than or equal to M2, then in moving from M1 to M2, you do not lose truth values. So anything that was true before is still true. Anything that was false before is still false. Okay, so that's the same with the monotonicity lemma. If M1 is less than M2, then for any closed A in the language of M1 or M2, okay, I mean, they've got the same language because they've got the same domain. Um, if A is true in M1, then it's true in M2, and similarly for falsity. Now, I'm not going to prove these results here. They're pretty standard. Uh, if you just think about it for a moment, the definition of um, less than equal to guarantees a result for the atomic sentences and then a simple induction over the construction of the um, uh, quantifiers and connectives does the rest. So that's monotonicity. And monotonicity is going to be absolutely central to what we do. All right. Now, um, there is another model theoretic technique which has been deployed in uh, construction of models for naive set theory, which I, I'm not going to use today, but I will mention it, so let's have it on the table. This is called the collapsing lemma. And the collapsing lemma goes as follows. Um, suppose you've got an interpretation M, which is an LP interpretation. And that, of course, includes classical interpretations. Because you know, every classical interpretation is an LP interpretation. It's just one where, for every predicate, the extension and the anti-extension are ex uh, exclusive. You've already got exhaustivity, but if you impose exclusivity, you just get classical interpretations. So uh, M is any LP interpretation, and that includes classical interpretations. Tilde is an equivalence relation on the domain. And uh, if D is in the domain, D in square brackets is its equivalence class. OK. So given M, I'm going to define a new interpretation, uh, which is the collapsed interpretation, M tilde, with domain D tilde and denotation function delta tilde. And the definition is actually quite um, straightforward. So uh, the domain of the collapsed interpretation is the set of equivalence classes of the old model. And uh, the denotation of a constant is just the equivalence class of the denotation of the old constant. And then uh, the denotation of an n place predicate uh, is, um, okay, well the definition's there. So let me just draw a picture uh, and you can see what's going on. Okay, so here is the, the old domain. You've got an equivalence relation, so that partitions um, the old domain into blocks, and the domain of the collapse interpretation are just the blocks. Okay, um, so uh, just take for the sake of illustration a, a monadic predicate P. When does this block have, when is that in the extension of P? Well, just if you can find something in the block which was in the extension of P in the original interpretation. 
so, and, and same for anti-extensions. So um, the block is in the anti-extension of P just if uh, there was uh, something in the old block which was in the anti-extension of P in the old interpretation. So what's actually going on here is that we're actually identifying all the things in a block. Okay? So the properties of the block are essential in the collapsed interpretation are the properties of all its members. So, you know, if, if um, uh, Stuart and Steve and I find ourselves in a block, then the block is going to be British and American and Australian and not British and not American and not Australian. So you can see how it's going to, even if you start off with a classical model, when you collapse, you're going to get a, a, an inconsistent model, okay? All right, um, so that, that's the general picture of collapse. Um, that's really what these truth and falsity conditions, or the extension and anti-extension conditions are doing, okay? It's just a way of making that precise for an n place predicate. All right, so that's the collapsed interpretation, and uh, the collapsing lemma tells you, again, that uh, when you collapse, you do not lose truth values. Um, so if A is true in our original interpretation M, it's also true in the collapsed interpretation M tilde, and same for falsity. Now, again, I'm not going to prove this. Um, it's, it's, not, it's really not hard to prove. Uh, the, the definition of... Uh, delta tilde gives you the atomic case and then you use monotonicity to prove the, the, for the induction uh, for the other cases. So that's the collapsing lemma. Oh no, you, you gain truth values generally. Um, as, I, as I noted just now, if you start off with a classical model and, and you make a non-trivial collapse you're going to get an inconsistent model. So there are going to be some things some contradictions which are true in the collapse model, which weren't true in the original model. Okay, but... What is the significance of the parenthesis and in this statement? Sorry, Roy? Just to say that Plato's got to have might well include names of all the blocks. Oh, I see. Um, yes. Uh, so if, if you... Okay, so if you, if you start off with M and take its language, okay, and then you collapse, then strictly speaking, the collapsed interpretation will have a different language because it has, a, um, it has kind of fewer things. However, what, what's really important about the language is that everything has um, at least one name. Okay, so um, you can stick to the language of M uh, and it will provide a perfectly good language for M tilde as well. It's just that in general, things will have more than one name. So, uh, I, I've said for the language of M, it, uh, okay, it has to be the language of M for uh, the collapsing lemma to make sense. Um, yeah, so maybe the M tilde is a bit misleading there. Uh, but, I mean, because it's uh, because things in M tilde uh, can have more than one name, essentially, in the old language, it, it's not doing anything very significant. Thank you. So we that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, this is the crucial fact about both um, the collapsing lemma and taking a model and extending it, the extension or anti-extension of a predicate. I haven't given that a name, but uh, maybe I should do. So uh, let, let, let's call that extending the model. Okay? So if you've got a model and you increase the extent or the anti-extension of predicates, I'll call that an extension. And the important point about extensions or collapses is that if you start off with a model of a theory and you extend it or collapse it, because you don't lose any truth values, what you get is another model of the theory. It's going to model more in general, but you don't lose anything. So, in particular, if you start with, say, a classical model of ZF 
and you extend it or you collapse it, you still get a model of ZF. Okay, so this, this is crucial. Now, um, the, the rest of the paper is actually going to uh, produce some models of naive set theory and ZF. Um, the only way that we knew how to do this until recently was to use the collapsing lemma. So, um, if you think of the models, okay, so think of a classical model of ZF. Um, and let's suppose that you know, there's um, an, an inaccessible somewhere along there. Uh, th this bit is already a model of ZF. Okay? Using the collapsing lemma, you can um, play around with what's up here, and you can collapse things uh, so that you can make this bit behave inconsistently. All right? Um, and you can make it behave inconsistently in such a way that the general comprehension principle is going to be satisfied. It's, it's almost trivial how you can do this. In fact, I mean, what, what you, you can do is actually identify everything here. So you, everything here sort of collapses into one thing. And you then get a model of, um, well, not just ZF, because you had that to start with, but you get a model of... Um, naive comprehension as well. Uh, so then you get the, the kind of, you know, the, the consistent part, and then the funny business goes on on top. So uh, th this was one way that we knew how to construct models of uh, power consistent set theory. There's, there's a much easier way, and why I hadn't seen this before, I don't know. I missed the bleeding obvious. Um, so uh, the models we're going to construct don't use collapse, they just use extension. Okay? So I'm going to start with a, a model of ZF and then extend it in a certain way. Um, and all right, so that, that gives you a slightly different picture of a model of um, set theory. So, um, you know, the, the picture before was like this. Um, ooh. So you've got this kind of model of um, ZF, and then you've got all this funny business on top. So, you know, this is like the cone of the ice cream, and this is like the sort of the ice cream sitting on top, where, of course, all the interesting things happen. I mean, no one wants to eat this bit, right? Well, some people do. <laughs> OK. Um, so that, that's the picture you get by deploying the collapsing lemma in the way I suggested. The picture we're now going to get is rather different because um, we're not going to frig around with the uh, universe of sets. What we're going to do is make the funny business actually inside. Right. And, and identity. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to frig around with identity at all. All we're going to do is frig around with the, the extension and anti extension of the membership relation. Well, that'll have ramifications for identity, for the anti extension of identity. Uh, well, no. Um, okay, look, you're going to have the extensionality axiom. Uh, oh, well, that, that's true. That's true. Um, so we're, in, in, in the extended model, we're still going to have extensionality, but of course in a non-detachable form. So it might not mean quite what you think it does. Power consistent life is like that. All right. All right, so... Um, I'm going to start with a model of ZF, and I'm going to extend it. So, in particular, the extension is still going to be a model of ZF. And, of course, uh, if you've got choice and extensionality, well, you've got extensionality, if you've got 
choice as well, your, the, the, the extended model is going to be a model of those. All right, so that's fine. Um, the only interesting thing is, can you get a model of um, comprehension? And the answer is yes, and I'm going to show you how to do it. So, uh, let me... Okay. I, I'm going to just talk briefly about the last paragraph of page three. Um, just to... Get that out of the way. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take some of the members of the model and we're going to um, give them more members. All right? So we're going to increase their extension. So we're going to sort of beef up the extension and the anti-extension of the membership relation. Um, but we're not going to affect um, a lot of the stuff. So a lot of the stuff in the model is going to remain unchanged. Um, so suppose you've got a model and its cardinality is kappa. Um, you can divide that into two parts, x and x bar, where these both have cardinality kappa. Okay? And we're going to figure around with, uh, I forget which bit, this bit. We're going to leave this bit untouched. So uh, if your model is of size kappa, a kappa-sized part of it is going to be consistent. Okay? We're only going to fritter around with this bit. All right. Now, how are we going to frig around? Well, um, take any formula um, with one free variable, any formula in the language of this interpretation. Uh, how many of those are there? Well, um, uh, there are Aleph naught formulas without parameters, okay? But then we've got to take parameters from the domain. So um, if you've got a formula with one parameter, they're going to be uh, kappa many of those, two parameters, kappa squared, okay, for every finite. So that's, of course, kappa. So Aleph naught times kappa is just kappa. So there are kappa many formulas in the language of M with parameters. Uh, and what we're going to do is, for every such formula, choose a guy in here, uh, A of, um, let's call it A of little a. Okay? And essentially, we're going to beef up little a so that um, little a thinks it's actually the extension of this predicate in the language. And anti-extension. So all right. Uh, so look. look. Have, have a look at the construction, Stuart, and come back and ask the question again if you want to. Okay. All right. So when we extend M, everything's going to be the same except the extension and anti-extension of epsilon. Uh, actually, I might just add that I'm using members of the domain as their own names in this, this handout just because um, it, it just makes it a notational mess otherwise. Okay. So I, I'm not distinguishing between use and mention here for members of the domain, but this is just a technicality. Okay, so have a look at um, the first displayed definition on section six. So this tells you what the extension and anti-extension of the membership relation are in the new interpretation. Now, first of all, it extends the old extension and anti-extension of membership. Okay, that's delta plus epsilon. 
So this is going to be an extension. And that bit is going to guarantee that everything true in M is true in the extended model. The uh, difference comes when we add some more things to it. So uh, look at the extension of epsilon in the new model. That's delta plus of epsilon union all the set of pairs B and this selected member we've chosen, such that in the old model, um, A is true of B, if I can put it that way. B are, oh good, any member of the domain. And the anti-extension is done likewise, but you just throw in a negation. Now, um, in the extended model, the comprehension principle is validated. Okay. Um, let's just walk through the proof. I don't normally prove things in lectures, um, but this, uh, you can see how the trick is turned, and it's not difficult. So the proof's actually in square brackets. Let's just walk through that. So let B be any member of the domain. Then either uh, A is true of B, or its negation is true. You've got excluded middle. Uh, and let's take the first case. The second case is going to be exactly the same. So suppose that B is true of A uh, in M. Now we're constructing this new model, N. So by, monos by monotonicity, uh, A is going to be true of little b in N. But by the very construction, it's going to be true in N that, that uh, B is a member of this selected thing, uh, little a subscript big A. OK? In, in N. And of course, if they're both true, then the material by conditional is true. Um, and the false decays is going to be the same, except that it's not true and true, it's false and false. But again, the material by conditional is true. Um, and since that's true for any B in the domain, then the universally quantified sentence is true. And so you've got the uh, um, comprehension schema. So that's the basic construction. Um, what it shows you is that given any model of ZF, you can produce a model which is a model of both ZF and naive comprehension. And the thought is that when we come to survey the totality of all the models of set theory, then the non-pathological ones are going to be models of ZF and naive comprehension, and maybe some other stuff too. I mean, we still have to think about what criteria you might use for, you know, figuring out which ones are pathological and which ones are not. Uh, this doesn't solve that problem, but it's a it's sort, of, sort of step to telling us what um, the domain of models is like. Um, OK, so time is running out. If you turn the page over, um, uh, what, you actually sh what I actually show there is you can construct models of the same kind, which verify other interesting things. So in section seven, what I show you is you can actually construct um, a standard model within the domain. A standard model in the following sense, uh, so section seven, third bullet point, you can arrange for in the model N, the following to be true, well, schematically true, for any A, uh, A if no, okay, so you can find a, a member that you can construct 
a set little a such that it's true in N that A if and only if the object little a makes big A true. Okay. So you can get a model in which there is a standard model in this sense. Um, and in section 8, what I show also is that you can um, get a model of everything we've had before, ZF, comprehension, but also the claim that uh, the domain of sets is countable. Of course, it's uncountable too, because, you've got, because this is a model of ZF, right? Um, but the thought here is that, hey, you know, everyone thinks that Russell's paradox is paradoxical. Cantor's theorem is not. But, you know, Russell's paradox is really a sort of special case of Cantor's theorem. Maybe, just maybe, it's, it's Cantor's theorem that's the real fundamental paradox here. Um, and, you know, there are plausible arguments supposing that the domain of sets is countable. So, you know, maybe in the kind of canonical models of the theory, uh, it's true that the domain of sets is countable, but of course, because it's paradoxical, it's uncountable too. So, in, in section eight, uh, what's constructed is uh, a model of ZF and comprehension and uh, the sentence that the domain of sets is countable. Okay, so um, I won't go through the details. Uh, the, the, the idea is basically the same. You start with the model and you kind of puff it out to get the, the things that you want. Uh, let me just talk briefly about what I said I'd talk about is the connection between this and, and meaning. Um, and this is going to be very brief. However, uh, in the great divide between logicians, there are the people who believe in a proof theoretic account of validity and a model theoretic account of validity. All right. So I think Steve and I sit on different sides of this divide. Um, uh, Steve likes proof theoretic accounts of validity. I like model theoretic accounts of validity. So um, let, let's just suppose for the sake of argument that you accept a model theoretic account of validity. And of course, you can think of that as a theory of meaning in a certain sense, at least for the logical constants, because you can think of the truth conditions of the model theory as giving the meaning of the logical constants. Okay, so that's the connection with meaning. Now, so suppose that you uh, endorse a model theoretic account of validity, and suppose that you think of your model theory as being done in this paraconsistent set theory. Now, there's no problem about doing model theory. I mean, unlike, you know, Zach's approach where, you know, there's still a lot of hard work to be done. In this approach, you can do anything you can do in ZF if you assume that your universe of sets is, you know, one of these models of ZF. So that's all straightforward. Um, but there is uh, a, f okay, I was going to say bug, but it's not a bug, this is a feature. Um, because, um, hmm. the definition of validity is going to have to be cashed out in terms of um, material conditional, because that's all you've got now, okay? So um, a one-place inference, let's keep it simple, is going to be valid. Um, so um, within the theory of validity that you construct, this is going to be true if and only if for all uh, models of M. If M makes A true, then, and it's going to be a material by conditional, uh, M makes B true. And, I mean, this if, not if you can think of it as a definition, right? This, this is the thing you've got to concentrate on. 
So this tells you that a valid inference is one that's materially truth-preserving. Now, the material by conditional does not detach. That's the feature. Um, so, according to this definition of validity, you cannot depend on valid inferences to detach. Uh, and you might think, whoa, that's bad news, okay? Um, and prima facie, it certainly seems bad news. However, once you think about it, it's not so obvious. Because um, even though the material biconditional does not detach validly, it does in consistent contexts. So, uh, provided you can tell some story about how it's okay to use detachment in consistent contexts, you can detach in consistent contexts. And of course, you know, there, there are plenty of such stories and I'm not going to go into them now. But um, provided that this thing here is consistent, you can detach. Um, okay, when would it not be consistent? Well, when you've got this as well, which is not the same as this. Okay? This is just saying that M makes not A true. This is to say that uh, uh, it's not the case that M makes A true. And this is, I mean, this is, this is going to arise sometimes, but much less often than this. So you can detach, provided you're not in inconsistent context. And you still might think, well, that's, that's kind of odd. You know, after all, we did expect it to be uh, universally detachable, valid inference should be universally detachable. Um, actually, it's not as surprising as you might think. I mean, because suppose you do it the other way uh, and you use a relevant arrow for this, okay? Well, then the relevant arrow, being detachable, uh, is going to allow detachment. Um, is there such a big difference? Look, whether you use the arrow or the hook, these are just both true sentences. Detachment is an inference. It's not a sentence. It's an action. Okay? Detachment is when you've got this stuff in your belief box and you, you know, add something else. So, detachment is an action. It's not a sentence. But of course, it's presumably um, the truth of the sentence which grounds the reasonableness of the action. Now, um, if you go this way, the ground is always, always happens, right? But if you go this way, the ground is going to hold in consistent context, normal context, but it's going to fail sometimes. Now, that's a situation we're very familiar with in philosophy. Uh, let me just give you uh, an example. I mean, so, okay, so this is a very famous example. Someone asks you if, they'll, if you'll mine some weapons for them. A gun. Well, okay, it wasn't a gun in the original, but a sword, okay? And you promise to give it back to them. So that's the sentence is, I promise to give it back to you when you come and ask for it. Okay, so then the person comes and says, give me the sword back. And you say, well, what are you going to do with it? Say, so I'm going to murder my husband, my wife, my kids. Or you, or you yeah. Um, uh, now, okay, you promised to give it back, right? But that promise, the truth of that sentence, that you promised to give it back, does not ground the action, does not make it a reasonable thing to do, to give the weapon back. So the truth of something that you promised to do so-and-so can ground an action in normal circumstances and yet not ground it in abnormal circumstances. And that's exactly what's going on here. So, um, if validity is defined in terms of a material conditional, then uh, it's going to ground detachment in normal circumstances, but not in unusual circumstances, i.e. inconsistent circumstances. All right. Um, there's more to be said about this. Uh, this connects with fallibilism in general, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, 
But since this is a conference about kind of meaning and models and the things, I thought I would just say that the technical material we've been going over is not entirely innocent of consequence in this regard. Thank you.